Hello, Newport News. Hello, High Wycombe, and hello, Chicago. I'm here to talk about creative effectiveness. And Lisa Rowe, uh, who it started us out today, said something interesting about let's just do it. Let's just do innovation. And I'd like to add something to that. And it's very simple. Let's be creative so we can do innovation. People in my industry, in my consulting area, oftentimes get the cart before the horse. I believe that it's the creative horse that pulls the innovation wagon, and you shouldn't put one before the other. So in my short time here today at TEDx, NASA, thank you for having me, I want to talk about how we people, how everyday people, anybody, can exercise their creativity and their creative behaviors so they can have more ideas, get into that flow, get to the innovative results that they like. Because innovation is a complex problem, but I believe that there's always some simplicity and some holistic approaches that can address those complexities. So I'd like you to work with me on this today in creating something that you can use on a day-to-day -day basis. So right now, I want you to imagine a coat, some kind of coat, a jacket, it have lots of pockets. Close your eyes if you want to. It can be any style, any material, any, but as long as it makes you feel great. And it reminds you of the creative power you have within you. I'm going to give you a moment. All right, you have something in mind? All right, now every morning when you get up, when you see yourself in the mirror for the first time, don't be scared scary to me. I want you to put that jacket on because, and let's put it on right now, everybody. Go through the motions. This is how you learn whole body experiences. When you get up and look in the mirror and put that creative coat on, you're making a choice to be creative. And why would you do that? You do that because your brain does what you tell it to do. By the way, I think he needed more energy before me. <laughs> Amazing, cool stuff. But creativity is a muse. And yes, it sometimes is hard to capture in a bottle. And it is hard to, to get those ideas when you need them at the most you know, critical time. But the way that you have that capacity to get those ideas when you need them is by learning how to basically program yourself to have those creative ideas and that flow happen. So the first thing is simply to say, I choose this. I choose to be more creative. I believe in my own creative capacity. All right. Now I'd like you to imagine something else. You're holding in your hand one of those globs. And you hold out your hand and really sort of feel this and work with me on this. You feel that paper mache stuff they, you, they made in kindergarten, that really gooey, globby stuff? And if that's too gross for you, Play-Doh will work. And I want you to shape that stuff, just do this with your hands right now, into a heart. All right? Everybody got a heart? Now I want you to hold that and I want you to spray paint it gold. Watch your hands. Don that mask. And I want you to remember your golden heart because the golden rule of creative thinking creativity is do what your heart desires. If you want to have great ideas, it comes easily when you really care about what you're working on. And if, it, if you don't really care, you basically are telling your mind, I don't really care. I don't really want ideas. I know I say I do, but that's a phony thing I'm requesting of you. And it won't give you many great ideas because deep down you don't care about it. So you need to create links between what you're doing in your life and what your heart desires. Do you know what your heart desires? If you don't know, you need to go for an awful long walk by yourself and figure that out. Or maybe just sit quietly somewhere under an oak tree, take a deep breath, and listen. Your heart will tell you what it desires and what it wants to do. And you can know all the creative process, all the innovation process in the world, but it won't do you much good if you're not starting from a place of belief in what you're doing. 
So find a way to get to that belief. And if you don't like what you're doing, do something else. All right, now everybody, take your heart and put it in your pocket next to your real heart. And I want you to go tap, tap to remind you to do what your heart desires. Now, I want you to imagine a time in your life when you were young and you were playing and you were running around having a great time or you were tinkering with a really fascinating toy or you were building a model or you were using Legos. Everybody has a different sort of toy or play activity that they really liked when they were a kid. And if you don't, make something up. But remember, remember that time and that, how that felt. Because play is so essential. And I want you to hold that memory in your hand. And I want you to wrap it up in a little ball. Everyone do this. Actually create this ball with me, okay? I know it's corny, but it helps you remember. And rem this purple ball in your hand, representing play, is play is how we learn. How did we learn so much from the time we were just an infant to the time we were five or six or seven years old? We learned so much in that time period. How did we do it usually? We did it through some form of play. Guess what? The same thing is still true for us now today as adults. So if we're serious about our work, we'll play very hard at it. We'll experiment, we'll doodle, we'll look at it from different perspectives, and play is a great way to get a different perspective on things. So bounce a ball twice, put it in this pocket, and remember to bring play, put, inject play into all the things that you do. All right, now, imagine, if you will, a pair of rose-colored glasses. You know, the kind like John Lennon wore. And I want you to go like this. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, that looks so funny from up here. <laughs> I love it. Um, you you want to wear the rose-colored glasses of deferred judgment. Now, everyone knows in brainstorming, you're supposed to defer judgment when you're jamming on ideas. That's a given. But what I'm suggesting when I talk about deferral of judgment is living your life in a state of deferred judgment as a lifestyle, as a life choice, as an everyday thing. Why do I suggest this? Because really, a lot of times we're unbalanced in terms of the kinds of thinking we do. We do an awful lot of critical, analytical thinking. In fact, the more I notice how much I analyze things as I walk through my day, I can't go three or four minutes without criticizing or analyzing the living heck out of just about everything I'm up to. When you do that, your, your brain is thinking in a certain way. When you defer judgment, when you put those glasses on, you open up doors of possibility. You see things in the new light. And guess what? Ideas come to you. I think your subconscious mind is dying to give you the ideas that you want, the ideas that are going to help you fulfill your mission, to help you do well in your work, and to, do, to meet your challenges in life. But if we're always sort of like stepping on those thoughts and on the thoughts of others as well, by the way, deferral of judgment as a way of life is an amazingly useful thing when it comes to teenagers. <laughs> when my daughter was a teenager, this was the thing that I always was trying to remind myself to do. Put those things on. Don't listen to the language. Listen to what she's really saying, etc. Anyway, I go on. But let's do that one more time. Now, you can leave those on if you like, at least in a mental way then we'd be deferring judgment about the rest of my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Now, imagine, if you will, one of those old-fashioned foot-long rulers, those wooden rulers. Don't use a metal one, okay, because this won't work otherwise. But imagine a, a ruler. Hold it in your hands. Hold it right in front of you. Now, I want you to crack it over your knee, and I want you to take each piece and put it in your back pocket. Now, I'm asking you to do this. Thank you for cooperating. Now, we should also dance. Ready? <laughs> okay. I'm asking you to do that because I want you to put the yardstick of comparison, that whole idea of comparing yourself to others, 
behind you and dance. Because when you, <laughs> you stop comparing yourself to others, you free yourself up to become more self-expressed in all sorts of things. Because what do we, do? we tend to do? I've done this myself. Um, you know, when I was seven or eight years old, I stopped drawing because I compared myself to Sally Johnson. Her picture of her dad was so cool and mine was like a, you know, awful. I said, I can't draw, I'm never gonna draw again. And basically I didn't for about 30 years. Same with music. I picked a, I actually I picked up a guitar three years ago and started playing again. Now, when you throw away the yardstick of comparison, like I'm not Eric Clapton, okay? I'm not Mike Rayburn or John Stanfield, who you're gonna see later. I'm, in fact, by most independent measures, I'm a crap guitarist. But guess what? When I play guitar, it's fun. It puts me into a flow. It gets me thinking differently about myself. And I'm self-expressed. And I believe that self-expression is not the kind of thing that you can just turn on in one little area of your life. So if you want to be more self-expressed within the domain you're working in, be more self-expressed in everything, everything. Everyone here can dance. Everyone here can draw. Everyone here can sing. If you stop telling yourself you can't and you, and you throw away that yardstick of self-comparison and put it behind you. So that's the point. I'm going to move along. I was a big comic book reader as a child, if anybody can tell that. Um, I love the, the sense of fantasy and the imagination and I actually learned a lot of good vocabulary from comic books. But one of the things I thought was really cool was how Batman, who wasn't really a Superman type, he didn't have a superpower, he was always getting himself out of jams because he had some cool gadget. That's it. Now, you should have a magic tool as well. And that magic tool should have various creative and innov innovation processes on it. There are all kinds of stuff out there, and I wish I had more time here today to talk about it, but tools like trees, tools like CPS, tools like synectics, tools like mind mapping, tools like brainstorming, these are all tools that should be on your tool belt and on your magic tool. If you, you probably know some of these, but explore the other ones because they're interesting and they can be useful for you in meeting the challenges that you have. So, and the other important thing to note about tools like these, or the ones you're using, is that you have to practice them. It's interesting for me to see the difference between a group of people brainstorming who do it once a week and the kind of people who do it once a year. It is so different. The quality and the quantity and the fluidity of creative flow that the, the practice people get into versus the ones that don't practice. So if you have tools, use them. Use them on your challenges. Try them out. Experiment with the tools. But be careful. So I, to remember our creative tool, I want you to close it like you do with the safety, with the palms. So let's just do this. And either hang it on your belt or put it in your pocket. Imagine you're a 1930s era detective, or no, excuse me, not a detective. You're a, you're a reporter. And you, you, know, you have the fedora, and you have press on the side. And you've got that notebook in your hand. Hold it in your hand with your pen and smell it. Smell that smell of a notebook, all right? Now, a notebook is, is super important because it's the one thing, it's the one behavior that is just amazing in terms of its ability to take someone who's ordinarily creative effective and make them much more creatively effective. It's the one thing of creative thinking, in my opinion. When you have a notebook with you all the time, you'll notice more ideas, you'll write more down, and if you're good with it, you'll review those ideas once a week or so and put them into action to do innovation, like Lisa was talking about before. It's the one simple thing, it's the one thing. If it's the one thing you remember from this talk, go out and buy a notebook and have it with you all the time. So, it's 20 minutes till we get to work. We're driving into work. We know that as soon as we get to work, there's a problem on our desk waiting for us that is big. 
and it's going to require some real creative thinking, but I've only got 20 minutes, and I can't think of one thing. Uh. How many, be who's been there? Right, the whole audience, basically. And what you're feeling at that moment is the cold wind of fear. Fear is the enemy of creative flow, and it's the enemy of productive, creative thinking. The antidote to fear is very simple. You've got to put that jacket back on. You've got to reach into that play pocket. You've got to reach for that magic tool. You've got to get that notebook out. You've got to use the creative behaviors that are going to take the fear out of a situation and put you into this situation where you can be thinking of creative ideas to solve that challenge that's waiting for you when you get to work. So put that jacket back on. Now remember to turn that, put that jacket back on by tying the scarf around it so it's tight and it won't fall off. Everybody do that now, please. Thank you. Now, brief thing about innovation, and this is how I'm going to wrap up. Innovation, in my view, is bottled water, and creativity is the spring it comes from. There's wonderful processes, tools, and techniques, and other people here today are going to talk about those for deliberate, innovative process. Do that stuff. But also, be creative, be the spring. If you want a more innovative organization, everybody has to wear the jacket we put together today. If everybody's deferring judgment and so forth, there's going to be more creative ideas that come out of that environment, and those things are going to bubble up into the innovation you want if you put them into action and use those deliberate processes that you know about. So let's just walk back through our thing. Heart for what you want. Let's bang it out. Bang it out here, people. Bounce the ball of play. Wear the glasses of deferred judgment. Love how that looks. Have that tool belt. Let's close it up. Let's, tie, let's, let's sig sign off our notebook. Let's tie our, our scarf to remove the fear from innovative, from, from uh, the fear from the creative challenge. So that's all I have for you today. Take that jacket, wear it with pride. Thank you very much. <laughs>